Welcome to the Rotary Club of Milwaukee. That is our substitute Liberty Bell. I'm President Steve Chevalier, a director at Zilber Limited and a board member of the Zilber Family Foundation. As we gather today for our 10th time virtually in our 107 year history, we're gonna continue our tradition of reciting the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, especially the day after Memorial Day. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And now, Teresa Regan, a board certified patient advocate, will give our invocation today. Hello, all. In recognition of Memorial Day, I offer this invocation. As our nation pauses at this time of year to remember those in the military who have given their lives for the freedoms we enjoy, we ask for blessings for them and their families. We also ask for strength, comfort, and guidance for all who serve our nation during these challenging times, including healthcare and frontline workers. Keep them safe as they do such important work under difficult circumstances. May we keep deep gratitude in our hearts throughout the year for all those who have served. Amen. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, and thank you to Larry Barton from Strang Inc. for his return to work insights on our Thursday snack program last week. Uh, the program is now up on the YouTube channel, so you can check it out and feel, feel, feel free to share it with your friends. This Thursday, we welcome fellow Rotarian Beth Heller, who's going to speak about the Urban Ecology Center's reopening plan and how they have responded to the COVID-19 situation. And as a reminder, Rotary and the Florentine Opera are co-hosting the Quarantine Opera Book Club on Wednesdays at 5 p.m. Um, cocktail idea is provided, not, not the cocktail itself, that's on you. This week, the opera is uh, Il Triticchio. Tril tril Il Triticchio. My, my Italian's not good, sorry, by Puccini. If you'd like to join, email Michelle or visit the link on this morning's email. We encourage you to invite your family, friends, and uh, colleagues to our virtual meetings, uh, both the regular Tuesday meetings and our snack meetings. It only takes a minute to forward the email to a friend or associate, and they can uh, get the link right there in the email. It arrives in your box early Friday morning, so you have time to invite them. Uh, Rotarians recently received a letter from the club asking you to support Rotary's effort and polio, one of our big annual efforts for sure and therefore uh, support the worldwide effort to arrest the spread of COVID-19 uh, also. The Zilber Family Foundation told us that if we raised 12,500, they would match our gift up to that amount. I'm very excited and happy to tell you that we as a club have raised over $17,000 in donations. Thank you all, large and small, every donation uh, helped and we have reached a great level. And don't forget, not only do we have the 12,500 nat match, but then the Gates Foundation matches uh, those foundation, those gifts also. So we've really leveraged our gifts. Finally, uh, before we turn to our speaker, just a few words about Q&A. As usual, we're gonna use the chat function. So um, type your question or comment into the chat and we will attempt to get at all the questions uh, as we go forward. Uh, Jill Pelisek was going to introduce our guest today, Mark Markle. Uh, she's in, uh, encountered some noise problems at her house with some driveway work, so I will introduce Mark. Uh, Mark is a Vilas Distinguished Achievement uh, Professor uh, at the School of uh, uh, Dean of the School of Veterinary Medicine uh, in Madison uh, since 2012. He's been a UW Madison faculty member since 1919 conducting research in comparative orthopedics focused on bone, tendon, and cartilage regeneration. Uh, he's an equine surgeon by training. Dr. Markle served as the chair of the Department of Medical Sciences for 16 years and associate dean for advancement of the SBM for 11 years. He's a member of the Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine Center. He recent, recently completed a six-year term as chair of the AO Research and Review uh, Commission for the world's largest nonprofit orthopedic foundation, the AO Foundation, based in Switzerland. And he now serves on the AO Foundation board, overseeing the entire organization's activities. 
He currently serves as the president for the Association of American Veterinary, Veterinary Medical Colleges and on the boards of the Viola Zoo, the Wisconsin Veterinary Medical Association and the Wisconsin Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory. Mark holds a DBM in veterinary medicine from the University of California, Davis, and a PhD from the Mayo Graduate School of Medicine and a diplomate of the ACVS, or he is a diplomate of the ACVS. Uh, he's a special friend of one of Rotary's favorite uh, major projects right now, the Milwaukee Urban Stables, thanks to Mark. And the internationally recognized hospital of stables horses are going to be getting excellent uh, care, health care, at a substantial discount. So we thank him for that. And as an aside, Jill Pelisek tells me that she has full confidence in the treatment that we're going to be getting because she's brought 10 of her dogs over the last 20 years to the uh, hospital there and has had excellent care. So without further ado, Dr. Markle. Thank you, Steve. And I want to thank the Rotary Club of Milwaukee for inviting me to um, present to you today. I'm going to keep this relatively short. I've been asked to try to stay in the 15, maybe 20 minute range and really leave most of the time open for questions you might have. Um, as you'll see, as I kind of present, we are um, the School of Veterinary Medicine at UW-Madison is an international leader in infectious disease research. And with what's happening today with COVID-19, you'll see that we are taking an international lead on that front as well. And so what I usually start with a presentation like this is just to tell you a little bit more about the School of Veterinary Medicine for those that don't have kind of that background or history. I still, as I go around the state, have people that are perhaps surprised that we have a School of Veterinary Medicine or think that it just came into existence a few years ago. Uh, I know many of you, um, played a part in this, uh, but about now almost 40 years ago, the School of Veterinary Medicine was founded here at UW-Madison. Our, our first graduating class was in 1987, so they're approaching their 35th um, uh, alumni reunion in a couple years. Uh, in that time frame, um, we've grown to be one of the most respected schools in the country. Next slide, Pete, please. Uh, our often ranked somewhere between fifth and eighth in the, in the country as far as rankings. There are, as Steve highlighted, I'm the president of the Association of American Veterinary Medical Colleges, which is all of the veterinary schools in the world. There's 53 of those, about 32 in the US. Um, and so it kind of highlights our leadership on that front. Uh, next slide, please. Just to give you some of the demographics, uh, in the last seven years since I've been dean, we've grown our class by about 20% from 80 to 96. So we have 96 students per class. It's a four-year program. Uh, on average, we have a 1,300 applications for that. Uh, we, we accept about 62 or so uh, residents of the state of Wisconsin in each one of those classes of 96. Usually there's 150 to 180 applicants for those 62 slots. And then of the remainder slots of those slots to about 1100 applicants or so apply for those other 34 slots. And so it, it is highly competitive, particularly if you're in a state that does not have a veterinary school and there's about 20 states that don't. And so you have to apply as a non-resident in those programs. Next slide, please. So over the course of that 35 years now, uh, whereas you might imagine when we were founded, none of uh, the veterinarians in the state of Wisconsin were our graduates. Now more than 50% of the veterinarians in the state are alumni from uh, UW School of Veterinary Medicine. Next slide, please. And as Jill um, or Steve highlighted on Jill's behalf, uh, we have a very robust active uh, hospital here at the school. We see about 28,000 patient visits per year. Uh, as you'll see later when I talk about some of the new things that are coming at the school, we were designed uh, when we were built in the early 80s to see about 12,000 patients a year. So you can imagine uh, that we are very uh, constrained as far as our space. Uh, and it also leads to, in some specialties, long wait times. And so one of the things that I will describe to you is a project that I've been working on for about 20 years and really diligently on since I was dean for the last eight. And we were able to, in this last um, budget, uh, successfully enumerate uh, a sig significant expansion to the School of Veterinary Medicine, which was in partnership with our friends as well, who contributed substantially to um, the budget that we needed in order to be able to do that. Next slide. 
in that of those 28,000 patient visits, we have over 20 specialties in the hospital. Uh, they range from all the things you might imagine, oncology, which I'll talk about in a little bit, which is cancer care, orthopedics, special species, which are some of the pocket pets and other exotic species, equine sports medicine, large animal surgery, small animal medicine, dermatology, cardiology, you name it. And we have a specialist or a group of specialists in that particular arena. Next slide. We've also been critical in kind of advancing the state of the art in, uh, in animal and human healthcare. And we'll talk about that more when I, when I talk about our infectious disease research. But one example of that, uh, which led to an interesting and exciting development at the beginning of this year, was about 15 years ago, uh, one of the medical physicists at the school, at the hospital, at the human hospital, created a device that combined uh, what's called radiation therapy, linear acceleration therapy, with a CT scanner. And what it enabled uh, you to do is to really focus the energy on wherever the tumor was in your body, uh, rather than have to um, irradiate your skin, your muscles, your tendons, your bones around that tumor. And when he went to the FDA to get um, do a clinical trial, they said, you first have to do a clinical trial in animals. And uh, so in the end, we partnered with him and we, the, we used animals that came into our hospital with nasal cancer, which at that point in time, we could successfully treat the cancer, but almost always those animals ended up being blind. And so we used this new therapy called tomal therapy and successfully treated the cancers in all 12 of those dogs and spared their sight. So that resulted in uh, a, a later human clinical trial. The company became known as tomal therapy and is now one of those commonly used radiation therapy devices in the world. And we were the first school of veterinary medicine to have a tomal therapy unit, which as you'll see in, in the next slide, was a critical factor in uh, an exciting development that happened towards the end of last year and was broadcast in this year's Super Bowl. Uh, as highlighted, and you'll see this commercial in a second, uh, Scout is pictured here, uh, had a heart-based tumor that was causing uh, his heart, that tumor to bleed and actually uh, severely limiting his livelihood and uh, without therapy had literally weeks to live. Uh, they live in the north of Chicago uh, Scout's uh, parents. Uh, he is the president of WeatherTech, the floor mat um, production or, or manufacturer. And so ultimately they came to the School of Veterinary Medicine and where Scout had literally weeks to live, we um, started with tomotherapy, the device I just talked to you about, later chemotherapy. And throughout the next six months, um, significantly improved his quality of life to the point that um, David McNeil, the president of WeatherTech decided rather than do his normal weather tech commercial, which actually the year before had uh, demonstrator Scout was in that commercial, I, he, we created this commercial instead. If you wanna show that Super Bowl spot, please. Hi, I'm Scout and I'm a lucky dog. And it's not just because I found this cool stick or that I was in the WeatherTech commercial on the big game last year. It's that I'm a cancer survivor, had a tumor on my heart and only a 1% chance of survival. I'm alive thanks to a cutting edge program at the University of Wisconsin School of Veterinary Medicine. Their research has the potential to save millions of pets' lives. Pets make a difference in your life. You can make a difference in theirs. Donate now at weathertech.com slash donate. So as you might imagine, I- I'm Scout and I'm a- uh, development for us. No other school or even university has ever been in a, in a Super Bowl commercial. I think the reach is something like 135 million people. In the end, we had uh, donors that gave to us from every state in the United States, as well as from all over the world. It was, uh, the, the commercial was highlighted in Australia and uh, Ireland, uh, the UK, uh, New Zealand, South Korea, Spain, to name just a few beyond, you know, being on the national news here as well. So is it was a I think really beneficial to veterinary medicine and the impact it can have on both animal and human health, but also on the University of Wisconsin, uh, University of Wisconsin Madison, and the School of Veterinary Medicine. Next slide. And now I'm going to kind of move Hi. towards one of the things that um, we're best known for. Uh, we this last year um, received about $29 million in research awards, doubling over the last four years or so. Next slide. And what people don't realize about the School of Veterinary Medicine is that we do 75% of the infectious disease research on the UW-Madison campus, but more importantly, or equally importantly, 
Uh, UW-Madison serves as an international leader in infectious disease research. And although, as you heard Steve describe, uh, I'm an equine surgeon by training, I'm more interested personally in regeneration of cartilage, tendon, and bone uh, for people with arthritis and things like that. So I will try to answer any questions you might have on the COVID-19 front. But as you might imagine, we are taking a leadership role worldwide in COVID-19 research. But before we kind of do that, and I had a couple of our uh, researchers provide me with some slides on that front to give you an update on what's happening in Wisconsin, I did want to tell you more about what we do on the infectious disease front. So we, we have the world's leading expert in influenza and Ebola by the name of Yoshi Kaoka. I'll show you one of his studies here in a minute on COVID-19, but uh, Yoshi not only has created uh, an infection, uh, a universal flu vaccine that's in human clinical trials right now that for those that don't know, they have to recreate a vaccine every year trying to target whatever strain they think will impact uh, the US in the following fall. And usually they guess incorrectly so this vaccine is meant to protect you from all strains of the flu for five years. So that's in currently in clinical trials in Europe. He's also created an Ebola virus vaccine, a whole Ebola virus vaccine that when tested in non-human primates was 100% effective. And that's in human clinical trials in Japan right now. Uh, we also have an emerging infectious disease laboratory in Uganda led by Tony Goldberg, which is really meant to um, discover the next COVID-19, although that came out of China, not out of Africa. The Zika virus, for those that remember that outbreak from five years ago, that did come out of the Ugandan um, jungle about 25 years ago. So we're in there, we're there testing those animals to see where that might look. We also have a tropical disease laboratory in Medellin, Colombia. And we were the first to identify Zika virus in Central and South America. Also, we've created a Zika virus vaccine, which is now commercially available, marketed by a company called Takeda. So it just gives you an idea of, of kind of our breadth in the infectious disease research that we do. But I'll, I will spend some time now, about five minutes, just talking a little bit about the COVID-19 work that's being done at Madison. Next slide. And this is led by a number of different groups, but Tom Friedrich's one of our faculty members. And the group, which has created an international uh, consortium um, is really meant to look at where did it come from, how does it get transmitted, and how does it cause disease. Next slide. And as I think we all know, it emerged from China in late 2019. Some discussion about how it, um, where it came from. Most believe it came through a bat or origin originated from a bat through a pangolin, likely then infected a human through that pathway. At this stage, at least, there's not any great treatment options. Uh, it was true when this slide was created that infections were trending downwards in Wisconsin. I just looked today, they are not any longer. Uh, we are now above 500 cases a day and over 15,000 people that have been infected, 514 that have died. For Milwaukee, for your interest, 6350 infected, 276 have died. So we have, um, if you look at all the states, there's some sites you can do this. We seem to be on an uptrend as far as infections which could be a combination of people actually being infected, but also the fact that more testing is being done. And as Tom highlighted in this last site, and this is the part that's been a little challenging recently in Wisconsin and elsewhere, uh, is can you maintain or continue to uh, enforce some type of physical distancing in order to control infections? Next slide. So this is the consortium. There's 151 members of it, 35 um, worldwide institutions, again, led by us. Next slide. And what uh, the group at Madison's focused on is what, what actually causes the disease. And they're using a, a primate model to understand the COVID-19's pathogenesis. Tom's group, and I'll show you some of these slides, is really looking at genomic profiling of what's really called SARS-CoV-2, which is what causes COVID-19 infections. They're also looking at more rapid, low-cost pathways for testing. And then they're trying to assemble in a very open and public forum um, all these data so that everybody can be actively and in real time sharing that data. The next slide is busy. Um, well, this one isn't, but the next one is. This is what Tom's group is doing. They're actually sequencing the virus with people that have been infected. And as you can see with this slide, if you start to see groupings of those red dots, like the four on the top of the slide, that means that there's a relationship um, genetically between the virus, between those individuals versus, for example, the one that in this case would be the root 
um, sequence of Wuhan 1 down the blue dot at the very bottom. So the next slide, which is busy, but what it's meant to show you is not necessarily be able to see each dot, but realize that the red dots are Dane County and the gray dots are Milwaukee County. And what you can see is that fairly early on, there was a splitting of the genetic variability between the Dane County and the Milwaukee um, groupings, although both of the viruses came from Europe, they did not come from China. Uh, the original China, there was a case uh, in Madison actually that came from Wuhan that did not transmit at all, which is that very bottom little line at the bottom. Um, we actually, and I can talk about this in the question and answer, were the first uh, place on the UW-Madison campus that had a positive COVID-19 person. And I can talk to you about what that led to. The next slide kind of gives you the summary of how the virus uh, is, is related. So in Dane County, there've been many introductions, primarily from Europe. Um, the early importation from China did not spread. In Milwaukee, again, uh, there were many introductions. There's, there has been sustained community spread in Milwaukee and a few large, what they call established fires. As I said earlier, the, Matt, the Dane County UW health viruses and the Milwaukee viruses are genetically different, um, which demonstrates little mixing between the two as far as infections. And this could be related to travel restrictions, who knows? And they're continuing to continue to sequence so they can kind of track how the virus is moving between and among populations. Next slide. This is just an acknowledgement slide that I told Tom I'd show you about all the individuals that have contributed to the work um, that he's doing and others are doing. Next slide. Others asked me to talk a little bit about kind of animal testing and what is the likelihood that animals are involved with um, uh, basically transmitting COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 um, from animals to humans. Uh, there has been a couple of case reports of transmission, not between animals and humans, but among themselves of ferrets, cats, dogs, and other domestic animals, although a very small number of those. A publication last week by one of our faculty, Yoshi Kaoko in the New England Journal of Medicine, shows the following study in the next slide. So basically infected three cats uh, nasally, and they um, quickly by day one or day three for one cat um, be shed both virus nasally as well as with rectal swabs. They then put a different cat in each of the other cat's cage. And those three cats each became infected between three days for one cat and eight days for another um, after that introduction from, from being with the other cat. So cats can transmit the virus between each other, um, but they don't and have not been demonstrated to pass the virus between cats, for example, and humans. Next slide. And the reason that, although we do have the ability at the Wisconsin Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory to do um, SARS-CoV-2 testing of animals, um, we have elected or are, are trying to do it as little as possible, primarily because we are creating the test kits and the media for the human testing that we're trying to ramp up in Wisconsin. And so most of those resources, they're the same media and reagents that might be used for animals are being dedicated to human use and the other piece that's important, and one of the reasons why we're reluctant, is what do you do if you have a positive test? Our concern is if somebody finds out that their cat is positive because they're in a household that's had a COVID-19 patient, that they then might abandon that animal um, with no real justification for um, doing that. So that's the other reason that, that we're reluctant to do those, that kind of testing on a, on a kind of universal basis. Next slide. So as I said earlier, um, we were built almost 40 years ago now, um, very constrained, have increased our class size. For those that have seen the School of Veterinary Medicine, what you're looking at now is what's, what is a flat parking lot. Uh, the current school is in the upper right um, portion of that slide uh, with the diagnostic laboratory behind it. Next slide. And what you can see here is kind of a view for those that know the school, that is our flat parking lot. I'm looking at uh, the corner of observatory in Easter Day Lane by the creek where there's a bridge not too far from the natatorium. So this is the new addition to the school, which will double the size of our small animal hospital. It'll significantly, as I'll show you in a minute, enhance our large animal hospital and also significantly increase the basic um, and translational research that we can do to benefit both animals and humans. Next slide. This is from the other side of the school on its south side. This is what the current school looks like. 
um, straight ahead on your left of that slide is the diagnostic laboratory, but down below is the addition. That's a new large animal arena that will be covered. We will also house um, UW Madison police horses in that arena um, in, or in the in stables in that arena as well as being able to do uh, lameness exams and things like that uh, inside rather than where we have to do them today outside. Next slide. And this is just a, another view kind of looking that direction. Uh, that structure that's to the right top of your slide with, with um, is a five-story parking ramp that we were able to get successfully enumerated in the last budget. It's currently under construction and slated to be done at the end of the year. And kind of in that far distance to the left, the natatorium, which is one of our two significant student um, athletic facilities, the current natatorium is coming down in about a year or a little less than a year. And that is the new natatorium that'll be constructed in that 2021 to 23 timeframe. Next slide. So that's all I have as far as my presentation. I wanted to leave you guys plenty of time to ask any questions you might have. So it looks like we have about around a half an hour or so if you need it. So questions? Well, um, while we're waiting, but um, thank you. Oh, am I unmute? But th thank you. Okay, so I guess I am unmuted. Mark, you mentioned um, that you had a student at the veterinary school who was diagnosed with COVID early on. And what was the story behind that? And how did it impact um, what was going on at, at the vet school? So it wasn't a student. Um, in fact, we haven't identified who it was. So we'll start okay. with that. I'll say it was an employee. Um, so it was right around, it was the second week of March. Things were just starting to ramp up nationally, but there were still wasn't you know, widespread closures of any variety. Uh, we did have uh, one of our folks um, who had been traveling come back COVID-19 positive. Uh, and because we were the first case on campus, um, what it resulted in was immediate closure of the school, uh, the hospital and all components of the main building of the School of Veterinary Medicine wasn't, today it's much more clear, but then it wasn't quite clear what we were supposed to do. So there was contact tracing by the public health department with this individual to find out who he had been, in, who he or she had been in contact with. Theoretically, anybody that he or she had been within five feet for more than 15 minutes were contacted. They were tested. Long story short, the good news is nobody came back positive from that interaction. Uh, although that person had been in our hospital for almost a week, uh, probably positive, but not no understanding of how long. Um, she or he was shedding. The, what it resulted in though, is our hospital was closed for a week. We then opened it up basically six days later to only emergency only. And that has been the case, was the case for the first month. And then slowly have opened it up some more to more elective cases. Although now the way we're structured in the hospital is we do what's called um, concierge treatment. You don't, if you're uh, an owner, you no longer come into our hospital. We actually pick your animal up in your vehicle and then bring them in. We, we obviously do history taking and questioning out in your vehicle before we bring the animal in. On the student front, uh, within a week, campus, a week later, not because of us, but just generically because of what was happening around the state, we closed to all in-person instruction for all students, undergraduate, certainly our veterinary medical students and all graduate students. And so the rest and some may know the story because I'm sure UW Milwaukee faced a similar challenge is we had a one week spring break coming up. And then we um, had another week that we prepared our faculty or prepared our students for. So literally our faculty had two weeks to create the rest of the semester, semester's instruction virtually. Super challenging, um, really difficult in a number of different arenas. Um, but we're able to um, get all of our veterinary medical students through um, as well as uh, get our undergraduate students as well through. No students have been allowed on campus since March. Still closed, um, is closed at least through the end of the summer. There is significant discussions right now on what's going to happen with um, instruction in the fall and whether or not we're going to be most of us think we'll have some type of hybrid system where large classes will be taught virtually and then maybe small laboratory instruction will happen in person. We are pushing very hard for our fourth year students to get into our clinic because they've been 
the, our new fourth year students, which just started two weeks ago, have been being taught remotely right now. And our goal currently is to have them in the hospital on July 6th. So we're working with campus on all the parameters and safety measures that we need to put in place in order to make that happen. That's a lot, thank you. We can shift gears here for a minute. And um, you, we, I think it was mentioned early on that you are going to care for the horses at MKE Urban Stables. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you'll be involved there? Sure, um, we have Mark Brickman and, and who I know had something to do with uh, helping raise money for it, talked to us very early on. He's a good friend, uh, as well as to Jill and others. And uh, for those that don't know, uh, for the last six years, we've been taken a very strong interest in uh, basically uniformed animals. Uh, so whether it be police dogs or police horses and made a decision about five years ago to give a 50% discount to any veterinary medical care that any of those animals need. So at this stage, we have uh, agreements with 57 law enforcement agencies in Wisconsin. In addition, if you're in Dane County, we, we actually provide um, dollar support for both police dogs and police horses as well. So yes, we have that agreement as well with the, the police horses that are at the Milwaukee Urban Stables, um, where we um, give them a 50% discount on all veterinary medical care. Thank you. Okay. This is from Beth Heller, who is the Director of Education and Strategic Planning at the Urban Ecology Center. And Beth says that the Urban Ecology Center has eliminated wildlife research on mammals and birds because we understand that coronaviruses can infect both taxa. We don't want to transmit the virus to them or from them to us. Um, how extensive is the research about transmission between humans and animals? and wildlife in particular? So in general, uh, what I highlighted to you before, earlier is uh, the, the, the animals that I've heard of that have been reported, and I'm not an expert, but uh, as we talked about cats, and I think it'd take extensive interface with a human in close proximity, uh, likely in a household for that transmission to occur. Uh, there were uh, tiger, a tiger or two in New York that was infected, uh, likely by a caregiver. Uh, I know of no bird transmissions that I've heard of. Uh, and uh, as we talked about ferrets, and there's been, a, I think, three dogs in Hong Kong and one North Carolina, in North Carolina. So I think the transmission of um, the virus from humans to animals is going to be very rare and take prolonged contact. And more importantly, at least in most of the species, and this is true in dogs and cats and ferrets, they'd show no clinical symptoms or signs. Um, my understanding is the tigers might have shown some mild respiratory signs, um, but none that were uh, life-threatening or that I know of have resulted in any significant morbidity. So I think that the risk to the wild animal population would be small. It, I, I don't think you can ever say it's zero. And I think if you took appropriate precautions, um, you know, mask wearing and things like that, that it, you probably would be, it'd probably be a reasonable strategy to think that you're not going to have any significant impact on the wild population. So one question we had was whether the animals that had um, the virus had survived or had been treated. And I, I guess you're saying it's really not a big deal for the animals to have that. So yeah, none of the, none of the cats that I know of have ever shown any respiratory signs, um, symptoms. It was a bulldog in North Carolina, which uh, no offense to bulldog owners, they, they live with respiratory symptoms, but none that were probably attributable to COVID-19. The same was true in the Hong Kong dogs. Um, as I said, I thought that I heard that one of the tigers or maybe both had some mild respiratory signs, but nothing that caused any significant um, issues with them. And again, someone asked about dogs. And so there's really not a lot of data also about dogs, but that it probably could be transmitted from dog to dog. Is that also there? That part, I don't, okay. that, I don't know if I'd want to make that um, attribution. There's, there's only been three or four dogs that I know of that have been tested positive, And I know of no dog to dog transmission, unlike the cat study that, that I showed you. Okay. Um, are there tools to predict what viruses or types of viruses could jump from animals to humans? So what, what one place we're trying to take the lead on given 
our leadership position already is, is as a UW Madison campus is to create a consortium and our um, vice chancellor for research and graduate education, the Dean of the medical school and I have asked him to meet with, because basically between the medical school and the veterinary school and a little, little lesser extent to the College of Ag and Life Sciences are the leaders in infectious disease research on the campus. We're trying to create a consortium that actually is gonna to try to answer that question. And so Tony Goldberg's lab in Uganda, basically they spend all year sampling animals in the wild and then they can do sequencing to determine what viruses or bacteria they're being they're infected with. I think the super challenging part is to try to figure out which ones will transmit to humans. Will it have to go through a carrier like it seemed is what happened with COVID-19 by going from a bat to a mammal, which is a pangolin, and then ultimately to a human rather than directly from a bat to a human. So I think the answer is, uh, I think that's going to be a very challenging problem. I think the probably more rational pathway is to be ready with uh, when an outbreak begins to begin testing and create testing very quickly and to hopefully, and they did do this to some extent when SARS, as a reminder, there's two other coronaviruses that are significantly impactful out there. SARS from about eight years ago or 10 years ago now, uh, actually came and went quickly. Don't quote me on the numbers, please, but some number like several hundred were infected and then it went away magically. And then there's MERS, which is in um, the Middle East, which is highly, at high degree of mortality, even a greater to a greater mortality than COVID-19, but has never gone away, but has never really spread outside of the Middle East and North Africa. And so the, the, the point though is when there was funding around SARS, there was some initial vaccine development with SARS, but the money dried up as soon as the SARS patients went away, which is one of the problems that we always have. The same thing happened with Ebola. As soon as the major Ebola outbreak went away, the money disappeared. So then it's super challenging to create a vaccine, for example, that might be easily adaptable to the next coronavirus outbreak. And so there, there are companies, um, and we have two different COVID-19 vaccines in trials right now, one by Yoshi Kaoka, who's the one that had the Ebola virus vaccine. His company, um, or a company he helped create, is the one that um, provides the inhaled flu vaccine for children. It's a company called Flugen. That's in clinical trials. And we also have a uh, Jorge Osario, who runs the Tropical Disease Laboratory in Medellin, Colombia. And he's the one that created the Zika virus vaccine, also has a COVID-19 vaccine under development. But the, the goal is to have kind of a base bone of this vaccine so that if a new, in this case, coronavirus comes on the, you know, in the picture somehow, that you can create a vaccine much more readily than, depending on who you believe, the 12 to 18 months or earlier or longer um, that it might uh, take to create a vaccine. So I know it's a long-winded answer, but I think Thoughtful, it's very yeah. difficult to predict the next, the next um, pathogen. Um, can you explain, again, the connection between SARS-CoV-2 um, and COVID-19? Are they the same? No, so COVID-2 uh, is COVID-19. Uh, that's the official name of that virus. SARS was, again, you're talking to an equine surgeon, was a, co was a coronavirus that affected, um, that there was an outbreak of about nine years ago. MERS came into play a little bit before that, again, a coronavirus, um, and that's still active, although it doesn't transmit readily, but still active in the Middle East. So each one of those, COVID-19, SARS, MERS are each different coronaviruses ca causing a different disease. Is there any significance that the, um, the one virus in Madison that was originated from China really didn't spread? Is that significant at all or is that just a fluke? Uh, I, I actually know the story, so I'll have to tell it carefully. Is the person that, um, the person traveled to Wuhan, came back, was a physician, uh, realized this is in, I think the first week of January, might've been the second, had the had flu-like symptoms, um, realized because just 
literally just coming out then was that so she self-isolated had her family go somewhere else didn't leave her um a, a apartment other than to get swabbed and get confirmed and so you know i think because of her training and the care that she took uh ultimately did not transmit the virus um in madison but then ultimately and this was true of our case um most of the virus that affected Wisconsin came, and this is true of New York as well, came from Europe. Right. Okay. So does UW-Madison have the capacity to help with the manufacture of vaccines? So uh, the vaccine part's more challenging. There's a, a number of different groups um, undergoing development right now. So I think until we know what vaccine and who's producing it, that'll, that'll be uh, an answer that I really can't give. On the testing side, um, we are creating, uh, we are helping substantially with testing, meaning UW-Madison is as far as um, more tests, more, more rapid tests, hopefully more, more um, accurate tests. So that the testing side, yes, the vaccine side, other than we have several faculty that have vaccines um, in, in uh, clinical trials right now. So in that sense, yes, if one of those become a successful vaccine, that's ultimately marketed. Um, I think I'm clearing out the COVID questions here, but here's um, one that you might enjoy. What types of work do your graduates go on to do? So uh, be, as you might imagine being in the dairy state, one of the th reasons we were created was to benefit the citizens of the state and the dairy industry. And so we still train more dairy practitioners, more large animal pr practitioners, which obviously is a little challenging now with low milk prices. Uh, than any other veterinary school in the country. What does that translate to mean? On average, let's say of those 100 or so students that graduate from the school, uh, probably between 30 and 50 go into small animal practice, somewhere around 20, 15 to 20 go into large animal practice, typically dairy focused. And then the remainder pursue all the different things that you can pursue. Some go get graduate degrees, meaning PhDs, um, decide to be a specialist of whatever variety, uh, which usually takes what well, always takes uh, an internship and residency to do that. So give you an idea of my career trajectory, undergraduate at Davis, veterinary student at Davis, uh, ultimately did an internship at Penn, residency in equine surgery at Davis, but then did a four-year, a three-year PhD at the Mayo Clinic and uh, enabled me to be an equine surgeon and a researcher here at camp on campus. So about a third of our students go down that path of some variety. There's lots of career opportunities available uh, in a wide variety of arenas. It could be an industry, could be working for the government, um, certainly obviously in private, private practice or in academia. Okay. So if I have a pet, what can I do to protect them from COVID-19? I'd say in general, they're so low of a likelihood that they're gonna be infected that you don't need to worry about it, but keep them home. Um, the one recommendation that um, has been made, even though there's no you know, typical symptoms that are shown, but if you know you have a COVID-19 positive person in your household, if you can try to cordon that animal off away from that person um, while you're infected, uh, which is typically for a couple of weeks, uh, in order to make sure that you don't transmit the virus to your cat as an example. Obviously that depends on your living situation uh, it's probably a good idea anyway, if you have other humans that are living in your household, if you're COVID-19 positive, to try to cordon yourself off from the humans mm -hmm. in your house. It's probably the same strategy you would take with other, um, both human and animal uh, companions that live with you. So I think that that wraps up, but I mean, so how's Scout doing? Well, that's the sad part of the story, um, that Scout was doing really well uh, through about the second week of February, third week of February, and then had a, he had a recurrence of bleeding around his heart, uh, did some more immunotherapy and chemotherapy, and uh, basically uh, Scout's owners decided in uh, the end of the first week of March, beginning of the second week of March, I guess, um, to have him euthanized, sadly. Uh, so although we extended his life by probably eight months when he had you know a month to live when he was diagnosed, <laughs> ultimately succumbed to what we, we believe or was a hemangiosarcoma of his heart base. The good news is, um, is that after a, a 
period of mourning about two weeks ago, uh, Scout's uh, owner, owners, mom and dad, just uh, adopted a new um, golden retriever and now have uh, uh, a Scout replacement. So we'll probably see uh, her, she's a her, um, on uh, <laughs> one of the tech commercials one of these days. Well, that is good news. And um, I have one more question that came in, Mark. I don't know what I would have expected, but the number of global veterinary schools and students at Madison seems low. Are there enough veterinarians to serve the global agricultural and human companion animal needs? What do you think? So um, I'll, be, I'll clarify it a little bit. The, the 53 that I was citing are all of the accredited veterinary medical schools in the world. Um, and so there are 32 in the US, there's five in the UK, there's one in um, Utrecht in, in the Netherlands, uh, but there are many more schools than that worldwide. So for example, there, I think there's 150 schools in Brazil as an example, but none of them are, are accredited. So maybe focusing back on the US, uh, we believe that we're gonna have, depending on what happens with the economy, a shortage of veterinarians uh, in the US for at least the next um, seven to 10 years. Uh, schools have kind of addressed this in a number of different ways. Many have increased their class size like we have. Uh, there's been five additional schools created in the last six years. Uh, for example, one in Tennessee, one in Arizona, one in North Texas, one in um, Long Island, New York. Uh, and so I think there's been a, there's a pathway to try to make sure we're producing enough veterinarians, but we also don't want to go through what happened in 2012-ish, 10, 11, 12, um, with the global um, recession is for about a three-year period, because primarily because veterinarians weren't retiring, uh, probably because their, you know, their retirement portfolios had declined, our students were having difficulties finding jobs. And there was a worry then that we were producing too many veterinarians. So you want to try to do that kind of balance of producing just enough, maybe not to have quite enough to feed the market um, so that everybody can get a job, but not so much that, you know, some percentage of students like happens in law schools occasionally, that there's no employment for them after they graduate. Okay, well, I think we're gonna wrap this up. Thank you um, for taking the time to, to visit with us. It was really very informative and very helpful. I think we all learned um, quite a bit. So we'll have some virtual applause, which we're, we're all getting good at here. And Thank then um, I'll pass this back to, to Steve. Thank you, Mark. Obviously a fascinating connection between treating animals and treating humans. Uh, your work is helping all of us. Uh, Rotary has been a world leader in uh, some of those efforts in eradicating polio. So in honor of your presentation today, we'll be purchasing additional 50 doses of the vaccine to get us that much closer to a polio free world and also help in the infrastructure that's already in place, which may help with the COVID-19 uh, uh, vaccinations if and when they start to occur. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Thank you again. And now Scott Glidden has an announcement about the COVID uh, relief fundraiser that he's going to be leading this Saturday. Yes, um, so I thought it would be fun uh, if Rotary did some remote socializing uh, and we're hosting a virtual beer pong tournament. So it would be teams of just yourself, uh, six cups, two balls, and uh, we're using the house party app that uh, has become very popular with uh, most people quarantining to spend time with their friends and family. Uh, but we're going to do this um, tournament uh, starting at six o'clock this coming Saturday. So uh, we're looking for Donations of $50 or more, all proceeds for the tournament go towards Rotary uh, COVID relief uh, charities. So please tell your friends, tell your family and participate. Uh, I'll have Michelle send a link out to the Facebook group so you can share it with your friends and family uh, shortly after this. Thanks, President Steve. Scott, uh, where would the $50 donation be made to? How would you do that? Uh, you can go to the Rotary website on their donation button, I believe. Uh, I believe that's... that's uh, Steve, it, it, I'll, I'll just jump in. Oh. It, it, it will be in the email, um, but yes, you can also just go to our website and hit donate. And if we get $50 in this week, we'll, we'll believe it goes to the beer pond. So <laughs> right. I signed up. 
So ho hopefully I won't be the, I'll have lots of good friends out there. It sounds like fun. Uh, whether or not there's beer involved in drinking. Yeah, right, sorry. It may not be beer, but yeah. <laughs> Again, see your screen for some of the upcoming virtual events. Uh, the Quarantine Opera meets on uh, tomorrow. Our Beer Connector is back this Thursday in addition to the, to the Saturday program. Um, and be sure to join uh, that, that program if you can. Beth Heller has asked me to make a quick update on the program, the snack program Thursday at noon. Uh, it's going to be a, a refreshing virtual walk in the woods with UEC in, quote, my backyard. Not my backyard, but I think it's your backyard. Uh, the Urban Ecology Center uh, is approached delivering their mission during this pandemic. There's going to be clips from the popular new website, uh, talk with the education marketing team that helped with this uh, approach, and how it's going to be used uh, in, uh, for schools. It's getting off the ground in early uh, April, for example. Uh, schools are assigning the site to their students. Parents are uh, tuning in with their kids and see how Milwaukee's urban e ecosystem is going to be streamed across the globe. So that sounds like a great way to uh, spend a quick half hour on Thursday. <clears throat> in your connecting emails on Friday, we had a chance to learn more uh, about Karen Hung, uh, thanks to Barbara Velez, our prolific author. Uh, we're excited that soon she'll be uh, on the nominating list that will go out to our club to serve as club president in 2022-23. Next week, we welcome Lynn Sprangers and Mike Boucher to discuss the new documentary that they've made, Milwaukee's Socialist Experiment, which will premiere on uh, PBS on June 9th. So now let's go out and do some of the good in the world today, stay healthy, and be smart as we start to reopen our community this meeting is adjourned.